God bless you so very, very much. I want to speak to you this morning on the topic, a blessing for the stressed. A blessing for the stressed. <laughs> and thank you so much for your prayers. I had twisted my ankle, but I'm feeling all right this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it could have been a lot worse. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, the 10th chapter, Luke, the 10th chapter, beginning to read at the 38th verse and reading down to the 42nd, Luke 10, 38 through 42. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read a verse from 2 Corinthians, a blessing that Paul speaks over the church at Corinth, but it's obviously a greater blessing that the Holy Spirit speaks over his church. And it says in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So there is this blessing that's going forth, and it incorporates God's love, the grace through Jesus Christ, and the communion or the fellowship, the family of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to keep that in mind as we consider Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now, it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried about and troubled with many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken from her. Now, when we consider this portion of Scripture, we have to first remind ourselves that the Lord is not saying to Martha that service is wrong. He's not even saying to her, that she is doing too much, although that's a part of it. I believe that what he's saying to her ultimately and essentially is there is something wrong in this particular case with her attitude toward service. Now, it goes beyond that, but let's focus on that for one moment. The idea is there is something about the way that she's serving that is suggesting that there is something deeper going on. There is a, a greater need. There, so Jesus is addressing a deeper need by addressing the attitude of her service. And he speaks of it as being, in essence, stressed. In fact, he talks to her about being stressed and being unfocused. He's saying to her, in essence, you are approaching this thing in a way that is robbing you of your joy, robbing you of your peace, robbing you of your sense of call, robbing you of what ultimately defines service. And he seems to be suggesting that the reason that she is in this particular state is that the things that matter the most, she has neglected. So for her, the issue is not whether or not she is serving more than she is praying, for instance. It's more that the way that she is serving indicates the fact that she is missing the bottom line, which is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, you know that there are going to be times in every life when we become overwhelmed, 
where we become stressed, where we find ourselves saying along with Moses, for instance, Lord, why are you giving me this level of responsibility? These are not my children, as it were. Or we find ourselves saying along with Elijah, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I don't feel as though I have any help or I don't feel as though there's anyone still with me on this. Or we find ourselves saying along with Jeremiah, Lord, you should have told me how this ministry would tax me. You should have told me what this was going to do. Or we say along with John while he was in the prison, Lord, are you the one that should come or should we look for another? Or we say along with Jesus at Gethsemane, this cup is too much for me and, and I can't go on. There, there are times when we have a natural stress that's involved with the ministry. But then there are other times when because we are not in that place where we allow that stress to be alleviated by the Holy Spirit, that it begins to build up and build up and build up. And all of a sudden we begin to talk the way Martha is talking here about the fact that somehow it might be uh, true that the Lord has forgotten to care about her. She begins because she's allowing this thing to, to work its way into her heart. She begins to ask questions like, don't you care? Now, this is not a unique question. The apostles asked that question when they were on the water in the midst of that great storm. And they tried to wake the Lord up and say, don't you care that we're perishing? It happens sometimes. We get to that point where we are questioning whether or not the Lord has got his focus on us. But in some cases, it begins to fester and it becomes our confession. It becomes an element of our psyche. It becomes an aspect of our attitude. And it begins to show itself in the way that we serve. So in her case, the question was about the love of God. Now remember the threefold blessing that we just mentioned. The love of God, the grace of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. And then listen to her concern. Don't you care? And then... I've been left to serve alone. That is to say, I don't know whether or not the Lord cares right now, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to maintain myself in this service right now. And again, my sister has left me to serve alone. That's a question of communion. Is there anybody with me? Remember we talked about Elijah asking that question. Is there anybody left? Is there anybody with me? Now, this threefold blessing addresses her concern. It addresses the issue of the love of God, of the grace of Jesus Christ, that is the capacity of Christ to push us along in this ministry and to draw us to himself. And it addresses the issue of koinonia, the issue of communion, the issue of family, the issue of fellowship. Am I alone or is there someone who will stand beside me? The issue that we're talking about this morning is the kind of stress that allows us to perpetually question the love of God or perpetually question whether or not we have been given the grace to fulfill what God has called us to or whether or not there is anybody that we can trust. Sometimes we get so busy, sometimes we get so involved in things that we forget to enter into that one place where God can reaffirm, God can confirm, God can reassure us of these very significant issues. That's why the Lord said with regard to Martha, considering her attitude, that Mary has chosen that one thing that is necessary. The other things matter. But there is one thing that is necessary. If we are with God in the holy place, then he can perpetually answer those questions. Questions about his love, questions about his grace, questions about his fellowship. If we're with him in the holy place. Now, there was another way that Martha might have addressed the issues of her heart. Now, if you take Luke 10 and you superimpose it onto John 12, you will get a bigger picture and a deeper picture of what went on at that dinner. 
Now, Luke has this story in one place in the Holy Scriptures because he's developing a topical theme, whereas John has it in another place in the Scriptures because he's developing a more historical or chronological scene. He's trying to show that last week in the life of Christ, but it's the same story. So now if you consider the fact that Martha is asking these kinds of questions after having seen Lazarus raised from the grave, after having known the concern and the care of God, after having understood what it means to have God stand beside you. For instance, if you deal with the issue of the love of God, my goodness, she saw him standing beside her and weeping over her loss, weeping over her concern. He came from where he was up in the north, came back down into Jerusalem, knowing that they were trying to kill him there because he loved her. She saw the love of God. There was no question in her mind the fact that Jesus loved her. The Bible said it, that Martha and Mary and Lazarus, Jesus loved. She even said, the person that you love is sick, is dying. So the love of God was clear to her, and the love of God is oftentimes clear to us. But when we get so busy that we forget to enter into the prayer closet, we forget to enter into that place where we're seated at the feet of Christ, when we get so busy that we forget that one necessary thing. We forget to have our times of prayer and our times of devotion and our times of meditation and our times of rumination on the things of God. When we forget to do those things, then even the things about God's character that are the most obvious to us become questions. All of a sudden we begin to wonder. Now she saw his love. She saw his grace. She saw the power of God to raise a man from the dead. This is a person who experienced what you and I might call a miraculous revival. This is someone who was used in that process by which God would raise a man. She saw other people being drawn into this same thing, speaking about the issue of God's grace and about the issue of God's community. The Lord speaking to some people and say, roll away the stone. To others, take off the grave clothes. All of a sudden, she's seeing the fact that God's grace is working and his grace is working through a community. So she knew exactly what God was able to do. She knew exactly who God was. She saw things that very few people see. She engaged Christ himself in theological communication. She began to talk about the great resurrection and all of the things that appertain to the blessed hope. She understood what it was to engage God in his word. And she heard him bring that word to life and to light when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. That word was not simply a letter on a page. She saw, she touched, she handled, as John said, the very word of life. She had all of these things in her repertoire. She had all of these things in her reservoir. She knew these things were from God. And so the question becomes, how could she ask whether or not he cared? And whether or not she could fulfill her call? And whether or not there was anybody to help her. Jesus pointed out why. He said, there is a thing absolutely necessary, absolutely essential, absolutely imperative. You and I cannot do this without that one thing needful. We must be in the prayer closet. We must have times alone with God. We must have times seated at his feet. We cannot reach back into our history and expect that to be enough. Martha could not evaluate the situation around her outside of that place that is utterly necessary. When you and I get into that place where we are stressed and we are having times of difficulty and we seem as though it's a little bit more than we can bear, we can't go back to yesterday and say, but I remember when the Lord did this and I remember when the Lord did that and I saw this and I saw that. That's wonderful, but it's not that one thing absolutely necessary. 
We can talk about the glory of yesterday. We can talk about seeing Lazarus risen from the grave. We can talk about the fact that God revealed to us his holy scriptures and made us to understand himself in all of the text. I am the resurrection and the life. We can talk about how people gather together and work together to stand side by side with God as he worked this wonderful miracle and he asked some of us to pull away the stone and he asked some of us to take away the grave clothes. We can talk about the fact that we remember what it felt like when Jesus stood beside us and he wept alongside of us. We can talk about the great feelings that we had and we can talk about all of the signs and wonders that we saw and we can talk about the fact that we were allowed to participate in the work of God and we can talk about how God separated the things that seemed obvious from the things that were clearly something special. We thought that by now Lazarus could not be revived. And we thought that the professional weepers over here had the answer. And Christ came in and he said to us, no, you don't understand. I can raise the dead. I can heal the sick. I can give power to men and women to stand beside me as I, in this particular case, raise up the dead. And in some cases, as I feed multitudes with a handful, and in some cases, as I speak and as I teach, in some cases, as I heal, remember, he sends people out to heal. He sends people out to, to pray. He sends people. And now we can say all those things happened. And when I get down, I can just pull from that. When I feel that God doesn't care, I can just pull from that. I can remember or I can do like Martha and I can just try to reproduce it. Try to make it happen again. Get really, really busy. Serve as hard as I can. Give as much as I can. But what happens is it just gets worse and worse. And we're asking those three questions more and more. Don't you care? Can I serve? Is there no one with me? Does God love me? Will God help me? Are there any people that I can trust? This is what happens when we do the work and we remember the testimony, but we forget the prayer closet. We forget that simple place at the feet of Jesus. So the Lord has a blessing for the stressed, and it's simply this. He pronounces over us. When we enter into that place, the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. And we get a picture of what it looks like when someone takes the time, when they put down the responsibilities for a minute, when they stop pressing and stop stressing, and they choose to rest at the feet of the Lord. You see a picture of it with Mary. Now the only difference between Mary and Martha is Mary stopped for a minute. The only difference, there was no difference in their character. They were both godly people. They both loved the Lord and the Lord loved both of them. But Martha got a little bit too busy. And Mary realized that it was time to rest. Now, I, now this, I'm just taking a, a little bit of liberty here, but I believe that they both probably were preparing for the dinner. I believe that Mary was with Martha at first and they were both doing everything that they could to get things ready. But when Jesus walked in the door, I believe Mary said for a moment, wait a minute, this doesn't happen every day. <laughs> Jesus is in the midst and I, I know that, that, that the, the, you know, the, the bread might might begin to burn a little bit, and I know the lamb might get a little dry. But this doesn't happen every day. 
I feel the Lord calling me. I feel him compelling me. And she knew that there was a place for her at the feet of Jesus because she knew that he loved her. Now, somebody might have said to her, no, you don't belong there. Because in that society, she might have been told that she was a second-class citizen. In that society, she might have been told, no, only men sit at the feet of the teacher. But there was something in her that said, no, God loves me. And there is a place for me. And I'm not going to allow myself to believe that there is a second-class status and I can't get so close to him. I have to serve him from afar. See, when you and I know that we are loved by God, nothing can convince us that we have to serve God from afar. When we know that we're loved by God, nothing can convince us that we can do the work, but we can't get too close. We can be about business, but we can't sit at his feet. We can volunteer for this and we can volunteer for that, but God doesn't really like me that much. So I serve from way back here because there's a possibility that if I sit too close, he might actually interact with my heart. So I'll do this thing and I'll do that thing and I'll do the other thing Because that might impress him. But he's not very impressed with me as a person. It took a lot for Mary to sit there. Even Martha thought that it was inappropriate. You can hear Martha saying from the kitchen, Mary, get back in here where you belong. You don't belong out there. And when you and I oftentimes are having a struggle with getting really close to God, sometimes it's the most well-meaning people, sometimes it's the closest people to us that are saying, what kind of presumption is that? You don't belong there. Remember in the days of old where David's brothers said to him, what are you doing in this particular position? But then, thank God, we also have people that will stand beside us like Mordecai. That will say, as he said to Esther, no, you're here for a reason. You have a purpose. You need to go into the king and you need to talk to him. Because if you talk to him, there's no telling what you can do. But you can't do anything until you go into the king, until you sit at his feet, until you hear his voice, until you get his word, until you know that he's heard you. And you know that you've heard him. See, for you and me, it's simply knowing that we are loved. The love of God. Knowing that we're loved. And then you see her again going in and acknowledging his great grace. She takes this perfume, this ointment, and she just pours it out. She lavishes all of her love. She expends all of her gratitude. She pours out. And remember what Jesus said, that what she's doing, she's doing in anticipation of his cross. She's doing acknowledging his grace. You see, she took an opportunity to just go in and say thank you. She took an opportunity to go in and say, this is the full essence of my worth. I'm taking everything that I have, everything that I consider valuable, and I am going to use it to acknowledge your grace. She goes in and she says, I know that there are going to be questions. And there were questions. Even as she began to pour out, Remember, the Bible says Judas begins to say, what kind of waste is this? But she decided that I'm going to pour out everything that I am because I choose to acknowledge the grace of God with everything that is within me. 
She goes into that place and she says, everything that I am is dependent on your grace. Everything of value is dependent on your grace. I lavish you with my trust because if you are not who you say you are, then I have just wasted everything that I am. Remember what Paul said, if Jesus didn't raise from the grave, then we are the most miserable of all people. With God, it is all or nothing. We put all of our eggs in one basket. If Jesus is not Lord, we got a problem. <laughs> because everything that we are is invested in his grace. Our sense of self, our capacity to serve, our reason for living, our desire in this generation, our function among the people. Everything is dependent upon the fact that God has given us grace. And she lavished her thanksgiving knowing that Christ was lavishing his grace. The same way she poured out her perfume, he poured out his blood. He poured out his life. He gave us everything. And she invested everything in that one who gives us everything. There was no question in her mind about the fact that God is gracious because she was there. I don't know what their house would have looked like. They lived in a place called Bethany, which basically means little house. <laughs> means house of little, a house of pain. So I don't know how big their house was, but I know they lived in a city called Little House. So in other words, what I'm saying is, how far could Martha have been from Mary? Because usually when we think about Mary, Martha, we're thinking about her in a kitchen in a completely different room. But there's a possibility they were all in the same room. And Martha was that close. That close to reassurance. That close to hope. That close to strength. That close to energy. That close to empowerment. That close to a blessing. That close to saying the food can wait. This is a time for me to sit at the feet of Jesus. That close to community. How alone can you be in a little house like that? All you have to do is acknowledge that there are other people there. The loneliest people in the world are those who refuse to acknowledge that there's anybody else but them. Yep. Amen. Yeah, heard heard one or two amens. That's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God I don't get paid by the amen. Amen. <laughs> 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 I'd be a pretty poor man, I would tell you. <laughs> but there was, thank God, communion right around her. All around her. And all she had to do was take one or two steps. But sometimes those one or two steps can seem like a mile and the three or four feet between her and everybody else could have seemed like a Grand Canyon. But when we do take those steps, and remember, Jesus comes to her. You know, she begins to speak out. And I imagine she's speaking out from where she was. And she's speaking in a way that everybody can hear it, not just Jesus. I'm all alone. Nobody's helping me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody is able to be trusted by me and that kind of a thing. And then Jesus moves in her direction because you and I can't move in his direction until he moves in ours. And he said, Martha, Martha, your attitude is all wrong. You're busy, but you're busy for the wrong reasons. He said, you're anxious, you're stressed. He said, you're, you're not focused, you're troubled. He said, but there's one thing that will alleviate all of that tension. 
there is a blessing for the stressed. And that's to remember the love of God. To remember the grace of our Lord Jesus. To remember the communion of the Holy Spirit. And that happens when you and I begin to move into that quiet place. To never neglect that time alone with the Lord. No matter how much praying we do in this church, and we do a lot of praying, a lot of corporate prayer, remind yourself that you have a responsibility, a personal responsibility. You and I have a responsibility to be here during corporate prayer because this is our home. But there is also that quiet place, that place where it's just you and Jesus. And there are no time constraints. We're not talking legalism here. We're not saying if you're not praying this amount of time or that amount of time, then something's wrong with you and this and the other. No, you know whenever stress is building up. And you know when you're crying out to God, don't you care? Remember, that doesn't make you a bad person. We talked about the people that cried out. Jesus cried from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You understand? We're not saying that if you're having difficulties and if you're having stress, then Something's wrong with you. We're saying there is a remedy. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. There is a remedy when Jesus says, I can't do this anymore. No, no, no. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. There is a remedy where you and I simply say, oh, I'm feeling this thing, this knot, and, I'm, and then we say, Lord Jesus, let me put everything down. Just for a moment, let me put it down. I'm not talking about if you're involved in ministry that you just quit. <laughs> you know what I mean? What I'm saying is carve out a time in your day. Sometimes it might be morning. Sometimes it might be evening, depending on whether or not you have children, where you work, and so on and so forth, what your hours are. But carve out a time and give it to Jesus. Lavish it upon the Lord. Pour it out before God. And he will help you. He will strengthen you. He will encourage you. He will speak a blessing over you. And you'll walk out ready to serve again. Ready to give again. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want to pray with you this afternoon or this morning. And my prayer is simply this. If you're feeling as though you're serving, but there's something wrong, you feel kind of like you're spinning your wheels, or you feel kind of like nobody understands what you are giving, maybe nobody has said anything to you, maybe nobody sees you, maybe you're in one of those positions of responsibility where people don't see you. You know, you might be going out, for instance, on, you know, truck like the Raven truck. And, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful ministry. But not everybody sees you when you do it. You might be working here at the church, backstage somewhere, you know, keeping the lights on and keeping the sound going and so on. And maybe people don't see you. Or you might be on your job, giving it everything you have. And you didn't get that promotion. You didn't get that raise. Or you might be home, praying for your family, praying for your kids, praying for your spouse. And you might not see a whole lot of progress. And you might feel like you're crying out alone and nobody's helping you. There is a remedy. There is a place for you at the feet of Jesus, a place with your name on it, a place where if God had a million, million, million people at his feet, if you're not there, he notices and he misses you and you miss him. There have been times in my life as a minister where I've been so busy and all of a sudden I would just kind of breathe toward the Lord and say, God, I miss you. And when I said that, it wasn't just emotion. It was like, I, I'm missing you. 
and I'm about the business and I'm about the business and I'm starting to dislike it and I'm starting to feel stressed and I'm starting to feel, you know, and then the Lord just says, you know where you need to be. You know what you need to do. There's a place for you. And by the grace of the Lord, for my entire life as a minister, he's always brought me where I need to be. Amen. Amen. There's always been that invitation, and thank God there's always been that draw, and thank God I've lived in the prayer closet. But there are times when we get busy. I know there's some people here who work 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours. They got your children, you're going to school, you're busy. But don't neglect the prayer closet, brother and sister. It's your life. I want to pray with you this morning. And I want to invite you, just for now, to come up to the front of this auditorium and to just breathe a prayer to the Lord. Like I told you, it's not, it's not about legalism. It's not about, you know, you got to watch your clock and say, well, i got to pray for an hour and this, that, and the other. But you do, when you come, just pour out. Lavish upon him his praise and say to him, I trust you. Say to him, I can't do this without you. Say to him, I need you. If you're stressed, if you're going through a little bit of a difficulty, going through a hard time, feel like tightness in here somewhere. You know, if you find yourself jumping at every sound and, you know, trying to find, you know, the quiet places on the street as you're walking down the road and trying to get out of this person's way and that person's way and it just seems too much. There's a remedy. There's a blessing for the stressed. Let's stand together in the house of the Lord. I want to give you an opportunity on the main floor of the balcony. Come on down and let's pray. Let's just sit with Jesus for a minute or two. Let's sit at his feet. Let's let him remind us of his great love, of his great grace, of his tender fellowship, of this family, of the fact that we are not alone. If you are online with us, just bow your hearts, bow your knee before the great God. If you are in the education annex, please Go between the screens, um, our ushers will tell you. Also, if you're with us in North Jersey, please follow the instruction of the ushers there. We're going to pray together in the house of the Lord Jesus. The Lord is so good, so gracious, so merciful. Praise his holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. What a great God, what a great God. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your presence in our midst. Thank you, we don't have to stress about anything. We don't have to care about anything. You said be careful for nothing, be anxious for nothing, be stressful for nothing. So we come to you, Lord, in the spirit of thanksgiving and we simply cast all of our cares upon you. We lavish you with our trust. And we remember your grace. We know that you love us. We've seen it. We've experienced it. But we're not going to try to pull back from yesterday's blessing. We're going to thank you for that. But we're going to enter into your presence now. And we're going to allow you to remind us that there is grace to keep on keeping on. And that there is love from God that passes all understanding, a love that cannot be defined. And we know that we're not alone. Even now we're standing side by side. We know that we're not alone. We know that the fellowship of the Spirit is with us. And the communion, the community of the Holy Spirit, the family of God, is with us. So we're not going to stand aloof. We're not going to stand far off. We know we're just two or three steps away from communion. So we're asking you to simply draw us into deeper 
trust. Help us to know that God loves us, that God has been gracious to us, that God fellowships with us. Thank you, triune Yahweh. Thank you for being God to us. Our Lord, I pray for my brothers and my sisters. And I ask you to lay a hand upon each one. Cause your grace to be so evident to us that we cannot deny it. That the enemy cannot deny it. That the difficulties of life cannot deny it. And even well-meaning friends can't deny it. We belong here. Now, Lord, we thank you for this time. And ask that your name be glorified in it. We love you. And we bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God's <laughs>